Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Part three, My Shore Adventure. Chapter thirteen, How My Shore Adventure Began. The appearance of the island when I came on deck next morning was altogether changed. Although the breeze had now utterly ceased, we had made a great deal of way during the night, and were now lying becalmed about half a mile to the southeast of the low eastern coast. Gray-colored woods covered a large part of the surface. This even tint was indeed broken up by streaks of yellow sandbreak in the lower lands, and by many tall trees of the pine family, outtopping the others some singly, some in clumps, but the general colouring was uniform and sad. The hills ran up clear above the vegetation in spires of naked rock. All were strangely shaped, and the spyglass, which was by three or four hundred feet the tallest on the island, was likewise the strangest in configuration, running up sheer from almost every side, and then suddenly cut off at the top, like a pedestal to put a statue on. The Hispaniola was rolling scuppers under in the ocean swell. The booms were tearing at the blocks, the rudder was banging to and fro, and the whole ship creaking, groaning, and jumping like a manufactory. I had to cling tight to the backstay, and the world turned giddily before my eyes, for though I was a good enough sailor when there was way on, this standing still and being rolled about like a bottle was a thing I never learned to stand without a qualm or so, above all in the morning, on an empty stomach. Perhaps it was this. Perhaps it was the look of the island, with its grey, melancholy woods, and wild stone spires, and the surf that we could both see and hear foaming and thundering on the steep beach. At least, although the sun shone bright and hot, and the shore birds were fishing and crying all around us, and you would have thought any one would have been glad to get to land after being so long at sea, my heart sank, as the saying is, into my boots, and from the first look onward I hated the very thought of Treasure Island. We had a dreary morning's work before us, for there was no wind of any kind, and the boats had to be got out and manned, and the ship warped three or four miles round the corner of the island and up the narrow passage to the haven behind Skeleton Island. I volunteered for one of the boats, where I had, of course, no business. The heat was sweltering, and the men grumbled fiercely over their work. Anderson was in command of my boat, and instead of keeping the crew in order, he grumbled as loud as the worst. "'Well,' he said with an oath, "'it's not forever.' I thought this was a very bad sign, for up to that day the men had gone briskly and willingly about their business." but the very sight of the island had relaxed the cords of discipline. All the way in, Long John stood by the steersman and conned the ship. He knew the passage like the palm of his hand, and though the man in the chains got everywhere more water than was down in the chart, John never hesitated once. "'There's a strong scour with the ebb,' he said, "'and this here passage has been dug out, in a manner of speaking, with a spade.' We brought up just where the anchor was in the chart, about a third of a mile from each shore, the mainland on one side and Skeleton Island on the other. The bottom was clean sand. The plunge of our anchor sent up clouds of birds wheeling and crying over the woods, but in less than a minute they were down again, and all was once more silent. The place was entirely landlocked, buried in woods, the trees coming right down to high water mark, the shores mostly flat, and the hilltops standing round at a distance in a sort of amphitheatre, one here, one there. Two little rivers, or rather two swamps, emptied out into this pond, as you might call it, and the foliage round that part of the shore had a kind of poisonous brightness. From the ship we could see nothing of the house or stockade, for they were quite buried among trees, and if it had not been for the chart on the companion— we might have been the first that had ever anchored there since the island arose out of the seas. There was not a breath of air moving, nor a sound but that of the surf booming half a mile away along the beaches and against the rocks outside. A peculiar stagnant smell hung over the anchorage, a smell of sodden leaves and rotting tree trunks. I observed the doctor sniffing and sniffing like someone tasting a bad egg. "'I don't know about treasure,' he said, "'but I'll stake my wig. There's fever here.' 
if the conduct of the men had been alarming in the boat, it became truly threatening when they had come aboard. They lay about the deck, growling together in talk. The slightest order was received with a black look, and grudgingly and carelessly obeyed. Even the honest hands must have caught the infection, for there was not one man aboard to mend another. Mutiny, it was plain, hung over us like a thundercloud. And it was not only we of the cabin party who perceived the danger. Long John was hard at work, going from group to group, spending himself in good advice, and as for example, no man could have shown a better. He fairly outstripped himself in willingness and civility. He was all smiles to every one. If an order were given, John would be on his crutch in an instant, with the cheeriest, Aye, aye, sir, in the world. And when there was nothing else to do, he kept up one song after another, as if to conceal the discontent of the rest. Of all the gloomy features of that gloomy afternoon, this obvious anxiety on the part of Long John appeared the worst. We held a council in the cabin. Sir, said the captain, if I risk another order, the whole ship will come about our ears by the run. You see, sir, here it is. I get a rough answer, do I not? Well, if I speak back, pikes will be going in two shakes. If I don't, silver will see there's something under that, and the game's up. Now we've only one man to rely on. And who is that? asked the squire. Silver, sir, returned the captain. He's as anxious as you and I to smother things up. This is a tiff. He'd soon talk him out of it if he had the chance, and what I propose to do is to give him the chance. Let's allow the men an afternoon ashore. If they all go, why, we'll fight the ship. If they none of them go, well then, we hold the cabin and God defend the right. If some go, you mark my words, sir, Silver will bring him aboard again as mild as lambs. It was so decided. Loaded pistols were served out to all the sure men. Hunter, Joyce, and Redruth were taken into our confidence, and received the news with less surprise and a better spirit than we had looked for, and then the captain went on deck and addressed the crew. "'My lads,' said he, "'we've had a hot day and are all tired and out of sorts. A turn ashore'll hurt nobody. The boats are still in the water. You can take the gigs, and as many as please may go ashore for the afternoon. I'll fire a gun half an hour before sundown.' I believe the silly fellows must have thought they would break their shins over treasure as soon as they were landed, for they all came out of their sulks in a moment, and gave a cheer that started the echo in a faraway hill, and sent the birds once more flying and squalling round the anchorage. The captain was too bright to be in the way. He whipped out of sight in a moment, leaving Silver to arrange the party, and I fancy it was as well he did so. Had he been on deck, he could no longer so much as have pretended not to understand the situation. It was as plain as day. Silver was the captain, and a mighty rebellious crew he had of it. The honest hands, and I was soon to see it proved that there were such on board, must have been very stupid fellows. Or rather, I suppose the truth was this, that all hands were disaffected by the example of the ringleaders, only some more, some less, and a few, being good fellows in the main, could neither be led nor driven any further. It is one thing to be idle and skulk, and quite another to take a ship and murder a number of innocent men. At last, however, the party was made up. Six fellows were to stay on board, and the remaining thirteen, including Silver, began to embark. Then it was that there came into my head the first of the mad notions that contributed so much to save our lives. If six men were left by Silver, it was plain our party could not take and fight the ship, and since only six were left, it was equally plain that the cabin party had no present need of my assistance. It occurred to me at once to go ashore. In a jiffy I had slipped over the side and curled up in the foresheets of the nearest boat, and almost at the same moment she shoved off. No one took notice of me, only the bow oar saying, Is that you, Jim? Keep your head down. But Silver, from the other boat, looked sharply over and called out to know if that were me, and from that moment I began to regret what I had done. The crews raced for the beach, but the boat I was in, having some start, and being at once the lighter and the better manned, shot far ahead of her consort, and the bow had struck among the shoreside trees, and I had caught a branch and swung myself out, and plunged into the nearest thicket, while Silver and the rest were still a hundred yards behind. 
"'Jim! Jim!' I heard him shouting. But you may suppose I paid no heed. Jumping, ducking, and breaking through, I ran straight before my nose till I could run no longer. Chapter 14 The First Blow I was so pleased at having given the slip to Long John that I began to enjoy myself and look around me with some interest on the strange land that I was in. I had crossed a marshy tract full of willows, bulrushes, and odd outlandish swampy trees, and I had now come out upon the skirts of an open piece of undulating sandy country, about a mile long, dotted with a few pines and a great number of contorted trees, not unlike the oak in growth, but pale in the foliage like willows. On the far side of the open stood one of the hills, with two quaint craggy peaks shining vividly in the sun. I now felt, for the first time, the joy of exploration. The isle was uninhabited. My shipmates I had left behind, and nothing lived in front of me but dumb brutes and fowls. I turned hither and thither among the trees. Here and there were flowering plants, unknown to me. Here and there I saw snakes, and one raised his head from a ledge of rock and hissed at me with a noise not unlike the spinning of a top. Little did I suppose that he was a deadly enemy, and that the noise was the famous rattle. Then I came to a long thicket of these oak-like trees, live or evergreen oaks, I heard afterwards they should be called, which grew low along the sand like brambles, the boughs curiously twisted, the foliage compact like thatch. The thicket stretched down from the top of one of the sandy knolls, spreading and growing taller as it went, until it reached the margin of the broad, reedy fen, through which the nearest of the little rivers soaked its way into the anchorage. The marsh was steaming in the strong sun, and the outline of the spyglass trembled through the haze. All at once there began to go a sort of bustle among the bulrushes. A wild duck flew up with a quack, another followed, and soon over the whole surface of the marsh a great cloud of birds hung screaming and circling in the air. I judged at once that some of my shipmates must be drawing near along the borders of the fen. Nor was I deceived, for soon I heard the very distant and low tones of a human voice, which, as I continued to give ear, grew steadily louder and nearer. This put me in a great fear, and I crawled under cover of the nearest live oak and squatted there, hearkening as silent as a mouse. Another voice answered, and then the first voice, which I now recognized to be Silver's, once more took up the story, and ran on for a long while in a stream, only now and again interrupted by the other. By the sound they must have been talking earnestly, and almost fiercely, but no distinct word came to my hearing. At last the speakers seemed to have paused, and perhaps to have sat down, for not only did they cease to draw any nearer, but the birds themselves began to grow more quiet and to settle again to their places in the swamp. And now I began to feel that I was neglecting my business, that since I had been so foolhardy as to come ashore with these desperados, the least I could do was to overhear them at their councils, and that my plain and obvious duty was to draw as close as I could manage under the favorable ambush of the crouching trees. I could tell the direction of the speakers pretty exactly, not only by the sound of their voices, but by the behavior of the few birds that still hung in alarm above the heads of the intruders. Crawling on all fours, I made steadily but slowly towards them, till at last, raising my head to an aperture among the leaves, I could see clear down into a little green dell beside the marsh, and closely set about with trees, where Long John Silver and another of the crew stood face to face in conversation. The sun beat full upon them. Silver had thrown his hat beside him on the ground, and his great, smooth, blond face, all shining with heat, was lifted to the other man's in a kind of appeal. Mate, he was saying, it's because I thinks gold dust of you. Gold dust, and you may lay to that. If I hadn't took to you like pitch, do you think I'd have been here a warning of you? All's up. You can't make nor mend. It's to save your neck that I'm a-speaking, and if one of the wild uns knew it, 
Where'd I be, Tom? Now tell me, where'd I be? Silver, said the other man, and I observed he was not only red in the face, but spoke as hoarse as a crow, and his voice shook, too, like a taut rope. Silver, says he, you're old and you're honest, or has the name for it, and you've money, too, which lots of poor sailors hasn't, and you're brave, or I'm mistook. And will you tell me you'll let yourself be led away with that kind of a mess of swabs? Not you. As sure as God sees me, I'd sooner lose my hand. If I turn again my duty— And then, all of a sudden, he was interrupted by a noise. I had found one of the honest hands. Well, here, at that same moment, came news of another. Far away, out in the marsh, there arose, all of a sudden— a sound like the cry of anger, then another on the back of it, and then one horrid, long-drawn scream. The rocks of the spyglass re-echoed it a score of times. The whole troop of marsh birds rose again, darkening heaven, with a simultaneous horror, and long after that death yell was still ringing in my brain, silence had re-established its empire and only the rustle of the redescending birds and the boom of the distant surges disturbed the languor of the afternoon. Tom had leaped at the sound, like a horse at the spur, but Silver had not winked an eye. He stood where he was, resting lightly on his crutch, watching his companion like a snake about to spring. "'John!' said the sailor, stretching out his hand. "'Hands off!' cried Silver leaping back a yard, as it seemed to me, with the speed and security of a trained gymnast. "'Hands off, if you like, John Silver,' said the other. "'It's a black conscience that can make you feared of me. But in heaven's name, tell me, what was that?' "'That,' returned Silver, smiling away, but warier than ever, his eye a mere pinpoint in his big face, but gleaming like a crumb of glass. "'That! Oh, I reckon that'll be Alan!' and at this point Tom flashed out like a hero. "'Alan!' he cried. "'Then rest his soul for a true seaman. And as for you, John Silver, long you've been a mate of mine, but you're mate of mine no more. If I die like a dog, I'll die in my duty. You've killed Alan, have you? Kill me too if you can, but I defies you.' And with that, this brave fellow turned his back directly on the cook and set off walking for the beach." but he was not destined to go far. With a cry, John seized the branch of a tree, whipped the crutch out of his armpit, and sent that uncouth missile hurtling through the air. It struck poor Tom, point foremost, and with stunning violence, right between the shoulders in the middle of his back. His hands flew up, he gave a sort of gasp, and fell. Whether he were injured much or little, none could ever tell. Like enough, to judge from the sound, his back was broken on the spot. But he had no time given him to recover. Silver, agile as a monkey, even without leg or crutch, was on the top of him next moment, and had twice buried his knife up to the hilt in that defenseless body. From my place of ambush I could hear him pant aloud as he struck the blows. I do not know what it rightly is to faint, but I do know that for the next little while the whole world swam away from before me in a whirling mist, silver and the birds and the tall spyglass hilltop going round and round and topsy-turvy before my eyes, and all manner of bells ringing and distant voices shouting in my ear. When I came again to myself, the monster had pulled himself together, his crutch under his arm, his hat upon his head. Just before him, Tom lay motionless upon the sward. But the murderer minded him not a whit, cleansing his blood-stained knife the while upon a wisp of grass. Everything else was unchanged, the sun still shining mercilessly on the steaming marsh and the tall pinnacle of the mountain, and I could scarce persuade myself that murder had been actually done and a human life cruelly cut short a moment since before my eyes. But now John put his hand into his pocket, brought out a whistle, and blew upon it several modulated blasts that rang far across the heated air. 
I could not tell, of course, the meaning of the signal, but it instantly awoke my fears. More men would be coming. I might be discovered. They had already slain two of the honest people. After Tom and Alan, might not I come next? Instantly I began to extricate myself, and crawl back again, with what speed and silence I could manage, to the more open portion of the wood. As I did so, I could hear hails coming and going between the old buccaneer and his comrades, and this sound of danger lent me wings. As soon as I was clear of the thicket, I ran as I never ran before, scarce minding the direction of my flight, so long as it led me from the murderers. And as I ran, fear grew and grew upon me, until it turned into a kind of frenzy. Indeed, could any one be more entirely lost than I? When the gun fired, how should I dare to go down to the boats among those fiends still smoking from their crime? Would not the first of them who saw me wring my neck like a snipe's? Would not my absence itself be an evidence to them of my alarm, and therefore of my fatal knowledge? It was all over, I thought. Goodbye to the Hispaniola, goodbye to the squire, the doctor, and the captain. There was nothing left for me but death by starvation, or death by the hands of the mutineers. All this while, as I say, I was still running, and without taking any notice, I had drawn near to the foot of the little hill with the two peaks, and had got into a part of the island where the live oaks grew more widely apart, and seemed more like forest trees in their bearing and dimensions. Mingled with these were a few scattered pines, some fifty, some nearer seventy feet high. The air, too, smelt more freshly than down beside the marsh. And here a fresh alarm brought me to a standstill with a thumping heart.' 